This is API Case Files. Hear this message. Tune this channel. Like E.T. said. It's December 2013, and this is Episode 1 of API Case Files, the official podcast of Aerial Phenomena Investigations. I'm Marsha Barnhart, API's Chief of Investigations and your co-host for today's program. In this inaugural episode of API Case Files, we'll review a few of our UFO cases from 2013 and present part one of our interview with David Marler, author of Triangular UFOs. Conservative estimates place these objects around anywhere from 100 to 300 feet in length as well as width. Uh, Also, Antonio Paris will have his investigator's notebook covering the all-important witness interview. And Paul Carr, API's Deputy Director, will introduce us to unidentified science. Now, to get things started, here's Antonio Paris, API's Director and the Founder of Aerial Phenomena Investigations. This is Antonio Paris, Director and Founder of Aerial Phenomena. API Case Files is a new podcast. It's about the scientific investigation of Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, UAPs, or UFOs. This podcast is about educating the public about UFOs and sharing aerial phenomena's investigations to investigate and study the phenomena. For API, it's not about confirmation of either truth, belief, or dogmatic denial. We want to collaborate with like-minded individuals and groups to study the phenomena better, more openly, and of course, more thoroughly than has ever been done before. We don't have all the answers, and neither does anyone else. This is why we investigate. For the most part, yes, we are skeptical, but we don't seek out to debunk or belittle. It's all about investigating the phenomena appropriately and following the evidence where it leads without jumping to any conclusions whatsoever. We're willing to admit when we're stumped, and we're able to take down bogus claims when a thorough investigation leads to conclude the claim is, in fact, bogus. But more importantly, we aim to educate and to assist the public in understanding the experiences they report to us. In this podcast, we will go into depth about actual recent cases we can share with you, including API's investigative methods and techniques, and new ideas about how we can move forward to a truly scientific approach. We hope to start a healthy and mutually respectful conversation within the community about the major questions and problems facing the modern scientific UAP investigator. What counts as good evidence? What is evidence for? and how to find, identify, analyze, and share that evidence. In each episode after this one, we're going to go into depth on one case with the lead investigator responsible for that case. We won't be giving away any personal information that will make it possible to identify witnesses. They've requested anonymity, and we respect that. But everything else about the case is fair game. Antonio. For this episode... Since we're approaching the end of 2013, we're going to have a panel of API investigators who are going to review the highlights of this year's cases, and more importantly, what is it that we learned from them. We'll also frequently have special guests on the show to discuss and highlight some aspect of the unidentified aerial phenomena topic. And in the field investigator's notebook, Antonio will break down some key aspect of investigative methods and approaches. For this episode, Antonio, I think you're going to have a topic of the witness interview. That's right, Marsha, and in Unidentified Signs, Deputy Director Paul Carr will talk about some of the obstacles to the scientific approach to UAP studies and how we might move forward in spite of those obstacles. We're also very pleased to include part one of an interview Paul and I conducted recently with David Marler, who's the author of Triangular UFOs, An Estimate of the Situation, and Antonio is going to tackle some frequently asked questions from the Internet. And we're also going to ask the API team to make some quick recommendations from their favorite books, field gear, podcasts, videos, websites, and more, all which will help shed some light into the UAP enigma, or at least help us while investigating. Okay, 
Okay, so in 2013, you know, we received a lot of cases compared to last year. For this year alone, we're already up to 162 cases. But we have to be careful with that. That doesn't mean that we actually investigated 162 genuine UFO reports. Of those, after we triaged, I'd say there were about 90 good cases that we looked at from the surface. And of those 90, 47 were fully investigated. And those are, those are what we call FFIs, which is full field investigations. And of the 47 cases that we actually investigated, about 89% were closed as, as identified, man-made objects, hoaxes, natural phenomena, etc. And about 11% we've closed as truly unidentified and unresolved, unidentified flying objects. Well, Antonio, why don't we just start with that high-profile case that you investigated, a purported 1947 UFO crash in the high plains of western New Mexico. How did that play out? Well, that's a great case, and I think for the next couple of years, that's probably going to be my favorite case thus far. It's not too often that we receive a report of, of a UFO crash, but more importantly, it's not often that we actually get alleged evidence. And in this case, we received a, a FedEx of several types of material that were allegedly from a UFO crash. Now, it's not often that we get that. So when I received that box, I initially thought that this is a cool case. Um, up to date, we've received about 500 cases, and this is the first time we got alleged physical evidence. So, you know, we looked at the case. We, we interviewed the witnesses who seemed rather, you know, incredible. And we decided with the few funds that we had at the time was to go out there and actually investigate the, the alleged crash. But I think the most important part of the investigation was the research that was done in the background by the team. And and when you converge the two, the research and then the actual field site investigation, we, we finally concluded that the uh, the UFO was actually a World War II AT-6 air crash that crashed out in the desert rather than a spacecraft from uh, extraterrestrial origin. Now, even that had a lot of controversy, though. It did, and there's not much we can do. You know, there are a lot of people out there that, irregardless of the evidence and the proof that, that we provide, there's always that hardcore believer out there that will continue to believe that something else occurred out there. And that's okay. My Our goal was not to belittle or debunk or to criticize the the, uh, the witness and those who continue to believe that a UFO crashed out there. But you know what? We're very open to this. And I always tell the witnesses that if they can come forward with better information or uh, perhaps a different location, uh, maybe we'll go out there and reopen the case. But I think the evidence leads to uh, that an AT-6 crashed out there. You know, we have reports. Wasn't part of the... Part of the conundrum here was a chain of evidence problem that we're going to see an issue raised more and more and more. Can you talk to us a little bit about that problem? Chain of evidence is very important. And in this case, uh, for about the last 20 to 25 years, multiple witnesses were going out there to the crash site, the alleged crash site, and finding these pieces of metal, etc. But I think what made this case very interesting regarding chain of custody is that there was no chain of custody. They took the pieces of metal. And it was presented for the last 15, 20 years at various conferences. It was, it was mishandled. It was touched by hand. It wasn't properly collected and sealed. And I think more importantly is that the evidence was allegedly sent to various groups out there to analyze the data, the material. And these groups were not accredited to do the, this type of forensics work, this type of metal, metallurgy work. And I think in one case, the first group that actually looked at the metal was a paranormal group out of Texas that really were not qualified or credited to do this type of analysis. So, you know, credibility, chain of custody is very important when you find this stuff. And I, and I told the witness recently that, hey, if you ever find another piece of metal out there, you need to find the look, you know, actually tag the location, tag it and bag it, have a chain of custody form and send it to whoever you want to analyze it to, and then they'll sign it and then go back and forth. You can't have the piece of metal being sent out to various groups and they're touching it, etc. And and that for me is is really bad handling of physical evidence. Boy, it would it would be great to get a case soon where we could start from the very beginning, the first report, be the first ones on scene, first ones to collect the evidence. That would be an exciting venture. What I've noticed uh, in the last couple of years is that you know for the first year for API we were getting old reports and, you know, things that we couldn't do, you know, if it happened months ago or years ago. 
This year, however, the, the momentum has changed. We're now getting reports that as early as 24 hours. So the message is out there that if you want to report a UFO or a crash or whatever, the, the Aerial Phenomena website is one of the websites that now come up. So we're getting uh, UFO crash reports that are very recent. And it's only a matter of time, in my opinion, is that we're going to get another New Mexico type case where it happened very recently. And then we'll, we'll be able to go out there and do our, uh, our forensics. I had some pretty good cases this year. I had 10 cases assigned, five of which I was able to identify mostly as weather phenomenon, which is interesting. And it gives us an opportunity to educate people and get some more information out there to people who are seeing unusual things in the sky. So of the five, I couldn't identify um, half of them were those pesky flying orbs that are just they seem to be everywhere, and uh, we can't really explain them. And other, several others were flying crafts of some sort, um, a triangular craft, for example, in the UK. But, but the case I wanted to talk about was 13022, and I found it interesting not because it turned out to be evidence of uh, alien interaction, but because it was a very common type of thing that people misperceive, and that it turned out to be a weather balloon. The neat thing about this was that the witness was able to get videotape of it, and he put it up on YouTube, so he sent us the link. The witness said that this was April 6, 2013. He happened to notice and videotape an object that was flying over his area, and this was in uh, Glen Oak area of Baltimore, Maryland. Now, he said the object appeared teardrop shape and had some kind of tether hanging down from it, so he figured it might be a balloon, but what kind of caught him odd was the fact that he saw the balloon at one point in time of the day going one direction, and an hour later saw what he thought was the same balloon going another direction. So that to him didn't sound like a balloon being carried aloft by the winds. And he had a point there. Uh, so I began to investigate that case. I had an interview with him, and he talked about it, and we took a look at the video. And the first thing I did, since he thought it might be a weather balloon, and I thought it might be a weather balloon, I contacted the uh, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and I contacted a guy named Bill Blackmore. He took a look at the video, and he said he could confirm that it wasn't uh, an NOAA weather-type balloon, but he did say it probably was what is known as a ham balloon or a, you know, an amateur balloon, and it was because it was kind of, it kind of fell over on itself, so he knew it was a inferior material that was made to just, uh, carry a loft in the wind by an amateur. So sure enough, I looked into that and, and I found out that there's a lot of solar balloons and a lot of ham balloonists that release things. And interestingly, this was on a Sunday. Both times he saw this on April 6th and again on April 13th were both Sundays, which is common for amateurs to have time to send balloons up. So that's what it ended up being. And I know a lot of people have seen that. In fact, that brings me to the point of the Project Loon by Google. I know that a lot of people have seen those balloons high up in the altitude, and we're talking about up there in the up in the stratosphere, the jet stream, it's like 23,000 to 39,000 feet is where these balloons are flying. And we find out now that this Project Loon that was undertaken by Google in secret was responsible for a lot of people seeing high-altitude white objects. And I know that there was a case in Kentucky where somebody had this, and he even got on the CNN News. This guy was an amateur um astronomer, and he saw this with his telescope up there, and I remember it made news, and everybody was saying, ah, yeah, there's your evidence. Well, what it was evidence of is Project Loon that was still under wraps, and now they've said, they've made an official proclamation that, yeah, that was one of their test balloons up there. So I thought this case um, was good to illustrate that common misperceptions are going to send you in the area of unidentified aerial phenomenon that ends up being identified. Paul, now you investigated a case here in Maryland also. It was a case 2013-020. Now, it took place in 2012, but it wasn't reported to us until 2013. So can you give us a little bit of information on that case? Sure, Marcia. Well, this was an interesting case for a couple of reasons. One, it was a very large, very luminous object, and it had, at least in principle, multiple witnesses, although one of the witnesses was quite elderly and has not really been interviewed for this case. The other witness 
was the driver of the car who was driving early in the morning down a rural Maryland highway, roughly between Taylorsville, Maryland, and Frederick, Maryland. And this highway is mostly vineyards and farms. The object that she saw was originally a very, very bright light. And then as they drove west on the highway, they noticed they started out being almost in their 12 o'clock position and moved off to their 9 o'clock. They, they saw a structured object. The object was, according to our estimate, quite large. could have been as large as 100 meters in size. Very bright, illuminated, appeared to have some kind of window structure or some other kind of structure. The light seemed to be coming from inside the object. She drove and drove. She was a, too frightened to stop and get out and try to take a picture with her cell phone. She kept driving until the object was no longer visible. It was behind trees and off uh, behind her. What we did is we, we went out to the site with the witness. who was highly cooperative, and we took measurements using um, an inclinometer application plus uh, compass meetings, and we were able to determine about where the object was and about how far away it was, its altitude, and its size based upon her estimates of what she remembered of the size. Now, of course, we were relying on her memory for this, so we have to put big error bars on the on the estimates. Now, the first thing we thought, given the, given the size, it, it only could be, if it was a man-made object, it could only be one of the larger blimps or balloons that are out there. We know the military is working on some extremely large blimps, but they're not flown often and they're not flown in this area. We also thought it could possibly be an advertising blimp and perhaps she had misinterpreted the size because of the illumination. It was dark out after all, and, and there's no way that you can get an absolute size or an absolute height or distance just by eyeballing an object at night. You have to have more than one vantage point, which in this case we did because she drove down the road as she observed it. And you have to assume it's not moving, which we don't really know that for sure. But the conclusion we reached was that although it could have been some kind of man-made, lighter-than-aircraft, we could not identify any craft that had been in the area. The commercial advertising blimps are, there's not many of them, and we were able to determine where basically all of them were. So we don't know what the object was. The other interesting aspect of the case was that we found some other apparently related cases in the same area. So we thought there might be some some man-made activity, but we couldn't really pin down anything. And we found other cases, including a case in, near Eldersburg, Maryland, which is not very far east of there, where a gentleman had seen and photographed a large object in the sky that the witness says in, in the 13020 case says was remarkably similar to what she had seen, even though this was a daytime sighting versus a nighttime. So we may have a pattern in that area. We're going to keep our eye on it. We do not have any idea what it is, but we're, I have every intention of following up on these other cases as time goes on. It's interesting that the, the lady witness that you had, as opposed to just being puzzled by what she saw, her, her mind went into an area of fear. That's, that's kind of interesting that she became fearful as opposed to just puzzled as to what she was looking at. Yes, well, I think a lot of people have that fear reaction when they see something profoundly unfamiliar. Me, I have more of a curiosity reaction, but uh, she's, um, you know, I, I don't think she's that atypical. Now, she she had noted that she had grown up around Baltimore and seen a lot of police helicopters. She'd seen a lot of other types of aircraft and other things in the sky. She described the light as brighter than that from a police helicopter searchlight, which is very bright. Yeah, I, the emotional reaction is interesting. And what's this, what is the shape of this object that she saw in the... Well, it, it's kind of oblong. The ske- we have a sketch, which is available on our website, and uh, I'll provide a link to it in the show notes. I would say it looks kind of like a – well, she described it as a building in the sky, and it does look kind of like a building lying on its side, a, you know, sort of a glass box type of building. It's not really, not really cigar-shaped. It's not really oval. It's more rectangular, oblong. So that's all we have to go on. Of course, I would want to caution, as I always do, that this is relying on one person's memory primarily. Memory is malleable, so... Building building size is pretty big. Right. Well, if she hadn't seen it from multiple vantage points, we wouldn't really know how what size it was. But if we make the fairly reasonable assumption that it didn't move a whole lot in the few minutes that she drove down that road, then we are able to determine approximately the size. And it was it was the size of a building. If you just do a little bit of, of, of math, you get the, you get the answer that it's... Um, it, we know about where it was. 
in eastern Frederick County, and we know it was quite large for her to see it from both of those vantage points. And you weren't able to get any uh, data from um, uh, air traffic control on that, were you? No. Oh, I should add one other interesting feature to this case. She saw a law enforcement vehicle ahead of her as she turned onto that road. So I contacted Carroll County. I contacted Frederick County, the state police, and I got nothing. No one, no one was uh, had seen anything. There were no reports to the Frederick County Sheriff of anything unusual. That's typical. You th- you have you get a case where you think there ought to be lots of people who saw this thing, and you can't find anyone. You know, nobody else saw it that we were able to identify. We put a video out saying, "Have you seen this?" Nobody saw it. We've closed that case, but I'm going to continue to look for patterns. Curiouser and curiouser. I believe Lawrence McNeil had a UK case. The case is effectively two brothers who saw a black triangle. Um, about half a, half a football pitch in size with two large white lights in its rear, um, allegedly, uh, near the city of Birmingham in England. And it was very close. It was less than a 1,000 feet. It was hovering over some trees. And very convincing, but it basically boils down to whether you believe the witness or not. Um, because they, they said it was definitely a machine. It was definitely solid. It was, a, it was black. It was flying. It was, very, it was silent. It was also slow. Um, and it was unmistakably some form of craft, which they were 90% sure was triangular, but it may have been rectangular. But, uh, I mean, to me, that was quite an interesting case uh, worthy of taking a look at. Um, as I say, it kind of boils down to whether you you believe the witnesses or not, because I think they were pretty clear that it was, it was a black triangle and it was, it was uh, nothing like they'd ever seen. And the most compelling part of the case is both of these are about 24 years old. That these are big, big boys, are well built boys that they were playing rugby, which is like you know med- English American football. And these these guys, two guys, were allegedly crying in the car because they were so shaken by the event. And that that to me was a if, you know if it's to be believed, was quite a a good piece of testimony. But that's effectively it lasted for about five minutes. And the, the final piece of the story is as they looked back from about two miles away, they saw a large white light lifting up above the, the town. Um, uh, so I'm not sure how many of these stories are, you know, you've had, Antonio, from England, but I, I thought it was quite interesting. Now, what was the year on this? I, I didn't hear any information on the, the date and time. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it was May 2013. Yeah, it was this year. As I say, there isn't much more to say about it other than the fact that they, they followed this object for several what, several minutes and... and they, they, they tried to rationalise it to see if it was, um, you know, it was lights off of the, they were tra- travelling in a motorway in a car. They were trying to rationalise whether it was um, street lights or, you know, lights that were, could be explained, but they, but they came to the conclusion that it was quite obviously a, a craft of some kind that was nothing like anything they'd ever seen. They said, something that makes you cry, if that's to be believed, is something, you, you can only think it's going to be something extraordinary. Now, Lawrence, did you happen to check databases of other UFO reporting organizations and see if there was anything that corresponded to their sighting? Uh, no, because I'm, I'm, st- I'm still in the progress of writing the report, uh, so, uh, um, so I haven't managed to get, I haven't got that far yet. Paul and I had discussed a case that he did. The, the female witness became overcome with fear, and we were talking about how seeing something in the sky rather than being puzzled by it, being overcome by fear is a, is, is a different kind of phenomenon that occurs with people. And the witnesses, the, the hardy young men that you saw, became over, overcome with fear to the point of crying? Which, as I say, it's, it's kind of startling. I've met, I've met this guy. He's a, he's, a big, he's a big young guy, big specimen, t- 24 years old. But I'll take on board what you're saying, Marsha, in terms of checking the databases as a part of the, part of the reports. I had a report from, from Birmingham. It was uh, 13016, I think it was. It was just due east of Birmingham in a, co- a place called Market Harborough. And it was about, you know, 40 miles. And I suspect there's, there's a lot of UK activity. And uh, flying triangles is one of the very common forms of ufos being seen in the area there and the witness i had she immediately went in her house because it just freaked her out to the point that she didn't want to stay out on her stoop and watch it anymore it's interesting the reactions people have to something they can't identify and you kind of wonder what takes them from the point of being 
interested in something they're seeing to the point of wishing to flee. Yes, very much so. I think I think the, the additional piece of information is that um, the, the the person who reported that he he's been sort of into UFOs for a while, but his brother is completely not into UFOs, and yet they both corroborated each other. I, I, I haven't I haven't actually spoken to the second witness yet, but I plan to do that. But they certainly corroborated each other's story, and they both are convinced that they saw a, you know, a black triangular object or craft of some kind. Um, and they say they were so shaken, they went home and told their parents, and it's been like an, almost like an obsession since that day. So for the last five or six months, they've been quite obsessed by the whole thing. Yeah, that's not uncommon either. Um, but I don't have any photographs. I only have a sketch of a triangular craft with two white lights to the back of it. Yeah, that's, that's what I've got. So Quickly, I just want to say that the investigative process, just like Lauren said, is very important. We don't have sketches of the Black Triangle. We don't have photographic evidence, etc. But based on what Lawrence is saying, that he can tell by what the, how the witness described it and his emotions, you know, something happened. They saw something. And observing the witness as they're talking is very key in the investigative process. Well, that's our review for 2013. You know, we, we had a great year. We had almost 200 cases. We had an excellent conference in the spring. And we also brought on some new investigators. And for 2014, I really expect a better year. We have two conferences already lined up, including API Con, which is in Tampa, Florida. And we also have API Con, which will be out of Los Angeles. And I'm also looking for, you know, three or four other researchers and investigators that really want to look into uh, UFO investigations from, from our perspective. So I have high hopes for 2014. <laughs> Join us for part one of our discussion with author David Marler. Paul? This book is by David Marler. That's M-A-R-L-E-R. It's available on Amazon and other places where fine books are sold. It's called Triangle UFOs, An Estimate of the Situation. The first book I, I've ever seen that focused completely on the triangle UFO phenomenon. Yes, that's the main reason I wrote it. The only books prior to that were published in French over in Belgium, and that primarily focused just on the Belgian wave, but there had never been a book-length treatise written about the history of triangular UFOs. You go in your book into a lot of historical detail. You list many, many cases, <laughs> from starting, in, I think, in the 1880s. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Yeah, as referenced by uh, Don Quixote in his first book, Flying Saucers Are Real. Now, could you summarize for us what is it that a tri makes a, a triangle UFO a UFO, and what sort of behaviors and, and structure that people are seeing that you think is anomalous. Well, just to hit on some of the highlights in the book, I profile what I basically found after reviewing all these historical cases: twenty common characteristics, but just a few to touch on that, to your point, really define this as a genuine unidentified flying object. One is just the appreciable size of these objects. Conservative estimates place these objects around anywhere from 100 to 300 feet in length as well as width. Of course, some of these are described as equilateral triangles, some as isosceles. So there may be slight variations on the size estimates depending on you know what side of the triangle they're looking at. But one uh, law enforcement official, 30-year veteran of a law enforcement who I know I've come to know personally as a result of my UFO investigations over the years, I like the way he described it, because as we all know as investigators, when eyewitnesses are trying to give us size estimates, they're very vague. And it's just, you know, when you don't know what you're looking at, you don't know the exact distance. It's hard to really gauge definitively how large something is. But his description, I think, really articulates the immensity of these objects and the dramatic nature of the sightings. He, he relayed to me uh, about a year ago when he was talking about his sighting back from November of 2000. He said, David... He goes, it was low over the field, he goes, and it was to the point where you couldn't look at it. You had to look from left to right to see the entire object, which, regardless of altitude, that's a, a fairly significantly sized object. That's one of the characteristics that really define it as something highly unusual, as opposed to some of the other reports that obviously we investigate where they're just simple points of light in the sky that are fleeting. 
The other unusual characteristic is the ability of these triangular UFOs, in addition to their immense size, to be virtually or completely silent when hovering at low altitude over the witness. And and with that, there's no type of wind disturbance, air disturbance, there's no noise. So it's not like a helicopter or something that could be misidentified in that, in that instance. And then the erratic maneuvers. I interviewed a number of aviation experts and tried to get their take on these objects. And, you know, based on some of the flight characteristics they, they, of their opinion, that they didn't think that this was anything that we had based on the way that it maneuvered. And one of those scientists just passed away recently, Dr. Paul Ziss, who was a McDonnell Douglas 30-year veteran. Prior to that, he was in the Air Force, and his specialty was advanced propulsion technologies. And I asked him point blank. He was interviewed during the famous January 5th, 2000 incident that I investigated involving a triangular object. And he was the point man as far as the media was concerned, because at the time he was in charge, he was the uh, dean of the aviation department at St. Louis University. And so they would often go to uh, Dr. Ziss for his aviation expertise, you know, involving either if it's a plane that had crashed or any type of technological developments in the field of aviation. And, and I asked him point blank, I said, I know you were interviewed regarding that famous incident back from 2000. I said, with the passage of 13 years now, looking back on that, and with your 30 plus years knowledge of advanced propulsion technologies, do you think that it was something that we had in our military arsenal? Or do you think that might have been someone else's? He had a rather interesting answer. He stated it to me. He goes, Dave, he goes, if it was just simply a triangular object that was reported, he said that might be something similar to what's been seen around Edwards Air Force Base. He said, however, due to the size, the way that this object flew, the supersonic speeds at which it was apparently tracked moving, he said, I don't believe that that was anything that we had. One of the values of your book, as far as I'm concerned, is the fact that you bring up these cases from the turn of the century. And so those who want to put it in the box of it is one of an unknown of ours really can't throw it in that box now because they have to deal with how could such a technology be occurring in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So that is a real takeaway from your book, as far as I'm concerned. That's one of the key points I wanted to really drive home with the book, uh, because obviously, if you search triangular UFOs on the Internet, many people just off the cuff are saying, well, this is just something military. This is a military object. And I do state in the book a number of times, some, and I underline that three or four times, some triangular UFOs may be military in, in origin. In other words, obviously, the F-117A stealth fighter, the B-2 stealth bomber has a roughly triangular configuration to it. However, when you look at the details, as I've outlined in the book, and Marsha, to your point, you can make that argument maybe over the last 10 to 15 years, but when you're going back to the 1950s and 40s, and even going back to the turn of the century, you can't ignore the historical data. I mean, you can't simply say, well, the modern reports are credible, but those aren't. You can't arbitrarily dismiss that. You have to go where the data takes you, and the data as you pointed out, has taken me back to the late 1800s, early 20th century. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can ignore the data. Another thing I find of value, too, is that you don't go into trying to explain the uh, phenomenon. You are reporting it and providing data. And most people don't have the ability to figure out the physics. So rather than try to nail that down, giving the data is exceedingly important going forward. Thank you. And I, and I specifically guarded against going down that slippery slope of speculation. The book has received really good reviews, which I'm happy to say it's my first book I've ever written. So that was very, <laughs> very endearing that a lot of people are appreciating the book, you know, for its, its, its you know, content. But it, there were a couple of detractors that said, well, you know, they really didn't go into explaining it any further. And it's just like, I can't explain it any further. You know, yeah. beyond, I, yeah. I really don't want to go down that, that, that line of speculation. All I can do yeah. is simply state there's a pattern of reporting that, that exists from credible sources, Air Force Project Blue Book files, British Ministry of Defense files, newspaper articles, where you can go back and actually research it and go back and verify all the facts that I lay out in the book. I really cannot go beyond that without going into the area of speculation. And I think there's too much speculation rampant in this field, and we <laughs> simply need to state this is the information that we have. There appears to be a pattern of, of reporting that exists. And 
considering the global scale of these reports, because I really try to cover a, a comprehensive swath of reports worldwide beyond just the temporal uh, you know, distribution as far as looking at over decade after decade. You know, I really just wanted to focus on the facts, so I, I appreciate that, Marsha. I have a question about the military aircraft. You, you consulted a lot of people. And I think much of that's in your book, in Chapter 9, I think. You hear a lot of the rumor mill about the TR-3B. Yes. A lot of people say, oh, that's a TR-3B, as if they had one parked behind the barn. Yes. Is there In any of your research, did you come across any credible sources that say the TR-3B exists? None whatsoever. <laughs> and I'm glad you brought that up, Paul, because I really... I really take that to task in the book. Again, I'm not arrogant enough to state that this craft doesn't exist, that we don't possess this aircraft. But there were two points that I brought up. Uh, obviously, there have been some whistleblowers that have come forward stating they personally worked on these projects, these top secret advanced aircraft. But I brought up two what I thought were very common sense questions that I posed to the reader. Namely, if these individuals that are coming forward are, are re- revealing classified information then why are they not being arrested for violation of their their security oaths? Because the defense industry takes that very, very seriously. And if you have someone that's throwing out all this classified information, they're going to clamp down very quickly on an individual like that. And two, beyond it being simply a story that these individuals are coming forward with, and I think we have to call them just that, their stories, they have no information, no credible information to back up these claims. And again, I can't say definitively that these people aren't telling the truth, but I would really raise a a high degree of skepticism when it comes to taking in these accounts. And I I think that those are some very common sense questions that need to be asked of these individuals. People could say the same of me. You know, it's well, what was your evidence that these triangular UFOs exist? All I'm simply saying is here's the history of reports. There seems to be consistency, which is suggestive of the fact that we're dealing with a genuine phenomenon. And my point being, the book, as I laid it out, these are from various and sundry witnesses spanning decades worldwide, whereas these reports of the TR-3B are really coming from one or two individuals. So, you know, I have to question that when it's only coming from one or two individuals as opposed to global reporting of similar objects. There's an awful lot of tasty cases in the book, far more than uh, most anybody is aware of. So as you know, many people know about the the, uh, Belgian wave. But I found of great interest the Tinley Park incident that that occurred in 2000, 2000 or 2004, was it? There were so many witnesses, and you apparently had pictures and video from enough witnesses that you could triangulate the area and determine a rough size. So can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on what I think is a seminal incident there at Tinley Park? Yeah, there were actually two incidents. It was uh, August 21st, I believe, of 2004, and then October 31st, uh, which obviously we just had the anniversary just recently with Halloween. That was just upon us. But it was interesting because in both instances, we even had some witnesses that had observed the August 21st lights and had observed the October 31st lights. And they were very similar in nature. And the very first night on the August 21st evening, a number of individuals had left what what was then called the Tweeter Center, which was a a big outdoor amphitheater where they would have many different types of uh, musicians and musical artists perform. On that particular night, the Ozzy Osbourne concert had just let out. So you literally, Marsha, had hundreds of individuals flooding the, the highways as they were leaving the Tweeter Center. And many of these people looked up and saw these lights, three very distinct, very large orange amber points of light. Some of that was captured on video, as you mentioned, uh, some still photography as well. And these objects were moving very, very slowly. And uh, in fact, in one sequence of the film, you can see either a commercial airliner or a helicopter flying by in the foreground. And in the background, you have these lights that are moving very, very slowly over the, the Tinley Park area, which is a very heavily populated area. In fact, funny you bring that up. I was just there last weekend for a uh, UFO conference hosted by Illinois MUFON. 
And this obviously came up in the course of discussion, you know, the Tenley Park sightings. But we had uh, hundreds of witnesses that had come forward. Uh, it was well documented by my friend uh, Sam Maranto, who took over as Illinois State Director for Move On when I when I stepped down from that position. So he was positioned perfectly there to uh, track down these eyewitnesses. And uh, as you mentioned, working in conjunction with Kufos and Mark Rodiger, trying to uh, ascertain what took place. And essentially, we had a formation of lights that moved over that residential area. And uh, hundreds of eyewitnesses documented that. And as I mentioned, then on October 31st, some of these same witnesses that saw the lights on the 21st of August uh, observed them on that night as well. And we have some really good video footage None of the video footage that has been analyzed can concern a shape. However, based on the movement of the lights, it suggested that they were not independent lights, but rather affixed to some type of rigid structure. And I think there's still being some analysis done on, on a number of those uh, video clips, but fairly significant, very similar in nature to the uh, Phoenix Lights case of 1997, where you had just hundreds of eyewitnesses observing these objects. And that's what's really interesting is, in the book, I, I talk about, obviously, individual sightings or small group sightings, but there have been waves of sightings. You mentioned the Belgian wave, of course, 1989 to 1991. But what was interesting is even going back into the research, as you may recall, uh, Flying Saucer Review did an article in the 70s, and in 1972, there was a wave of triangular UFOs sighted over Belgium. So the, the 89 to 91 wave, although more widely advertised and discussed, that really didn't establish a precedent. We had a 1972 wave, ironically enough, investigated by the same investigative body, the Sobeps Group, which just in the last month, I, I've been contacted by two or three former members of Sobeps, including uh, Patrick Farron, who in fact has all the case files from that, that famous wave of sightings. Well, now getting back to the Tinley Park incident, I'm, I'm curious because now you had pictures, you had videos. Now, was there any radar data, because I found most interesting that people noted there was no air traffic over the area during this period, which was uncanny in itself. Now, was there radar data? Is there any is there any evidence you have on that that you could bring forward? Because it was a big case. Do you have evidence there? I And, my, and I was not directly involved with this. Uh, Sam was. So uh, he was very instrumental in providing the information. But based on my memory, I believe Peter Davenport of the National UFO Reporting Center had filed a Freedom of Information Act request, but I don't know if anything was forthcoming as a result of that. Um, uh. And the video, the video evidence in and of itself, you know, I, I, I stated in my uh, lecture last weekend in Tindley Park that in my personal opinion, video evidence is very shaky, especially given our, our level of technology now and the way of being right. able to orchestrate or create very convincing looking footage. But from an investigative standpoint, to your part, to your point, Marsha, it was important because we had video footage, but corroborated by hundreds of eyewitnesses. So, yeah, you know, quite yeah, often we yeah. see the ubiquitous triangular UFO footage on the Internet, but quite often we don't even know where it originated from. You know, right. quite often it's it's a uh, an Internet user using some pseudonym, and we don't really even know the backstory on the video. The, the videos in this case were obviously substantiated by all this eyewitness testimony. In Belgium, when you had you had radar data, you had um, facts that UF that Belgian Air Force sent up fighters to intercept and that type of thing. Now that's record and it's um, easily obtainable. So I because that that's tangible. That's something that somebody isn't going to Photoshop, probably, huh? I completely agree with you, and that was what really captivated me with the Belgian wave of sightings. Obviously, was not only the the fact that they did have the radar data, but of course, the the uncharacteristic behavior of a, seeing a military group actually admit that they have it and releasing yeah. the information to the public. That was really a, a precedent as far as that was concerned. Uh, and that's what really gravitated my interest towards the triangular UFOs, to be honest. I became actively involved in UFOs in 1990, although I have a lifelong interest from when I was a child, which I outline in the book. But 1990 and the Belgian wave was what really captivated me. And then, of course, uh, 10 years subsequent to that, then we had the famous uh, sighting over uh, southern Illinois on January 5th, 2000. And in that instance, to your point, Marsha, I did obtain the radar data. And with the assistance uh -huh. of my friend Richard Taylor from the FAA, we were able to sit down and analyze the footage. And uh, we were not able to find any type of uh, target 
that correlated with the latitude longitude coordinates of the eyewitnesses or the times of the sightings. But when I was up at the, I actually was at Air Traffic Control Center at Lambert International Airport in St. Louis back in 2000. Richard took me up there. Of course, as I always like to comment, this is pre 9-11. This is before security was really clamped down. I literally walked in with Richard. He uh, helped install the systems there many years ago. Uh, He supervised Westinghouse installing the radar systems there. So everyone knew Richard and he'd been like a 30-year veteran of the FAA. But uh, a number of individuals stated that based on the low altitude that was described by these, by these eyewitnesses and where it was sighted, that it may have been obscured from their radar at Lambert International Airport. And at the time, Scott Air Force Base stated, because they were much closer to the area in question, within one mile of the estimated flight path of this UFO, they stated that their radar was down at the time, which I found suspicious. But then in talking yeah. with Richard and a number of the other FAA individuals, they did state, matter of factly, they said, well, they do weekly and monthly maintenance on their radar. And, you know, as you can appreciate, they typically will shut the radar down between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. simply because that's usually when they have minimal or no air traffic during that time uh-huh. period. Uh-huh. What I find interesting, though, is if that is true, isn't it interesting that this UFO, whatever its point of origin, decided to fly by the Air Force Base at that time? <laughs> Richard Richard uh, stated that, well, he goes, in the 50s, we used to be able to fly over the Soviet Union, and we could monitor to see if there were any active radar frequencies. He goes, whoever was mm-hmm. flying this could have possibly done the same thing and realized there was no active radar at the time and decided to mm-hmm. fly by the base and, and take opportunity you know, of that, of that time. I I just thought that was rather, rather interesting, regardless of who may have been flying this object. This is the API Case Files. And now here's Paul Carr with Unidentified Science. We're here because we sense that the universe can present itself to us in ways that no one entirely understands. But we live in hope for that moment when the light comes on and we see much further into the unknown and recognize the wonder it holds for us. That light will stay off forever unless we work together with a set of tried and true processes and tools that help us to harvest meaningful knowledge from our experience. We call this careful and reasoned way of failing better each time Science. And without science, we're almost certainly going to spend our lives stumbling backwards in the dark. Science is not about organizing the world into dry piles of lifeless facts and fixed dogmas, but about furthering our exploration into the unknown. Well-verified facts strengthen the foundation, but they are not why we explore, question, and try to understand. We do this because that is what we do. What we are. We need to stand on the shore to wonder and imagine what is just beyond the horizon and then to go and see. We need to. And the only boat sturdy enough to take us there is science. This is the first installment of Unidentified Science, the segment that will examine two key questions that have not been asked enough. Is it possible to study UFOs scientifically, and if so, How? In each episode of this podcast, I will unravel one thread of this complex problem. Our goal is to make the best case we can for bringing fresh scientific energy and serious scrutiny to the field. A few months ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing David Grinspoon, an astrobiologist and author of what is still my favorite book on astrobiology, Lonely Planets. He agreed that astrobiology has now achieved a modicum of scientific respectability, in spite of the lack of hard evidence of even the most primitive microbial life in other worlds. So why are small 
but highly respected groups of people working and even making a modest living in astrobiology. But the study of UFOs remains the domain of amateurs and is conducted behind a curtain of ridicule. It is because the astrobiologists have taken their science seriously and have based their work on what is already known about Earth life and the environments and other planets. They work from the known outward to the unknown. They have also been persistent and brave, facing quite a lot of resistance from their colleagues and others for decades before becoming one of the leading elements of NASA's research program that they are today. The lesson for UAP studies is clear. Our sharply limited time, energies, and funds should be directed toward what we can reasonably hope to understand now and hypotheses that we can form with the knowledge we have and test with data we can obtain. No jumping to conclusions or empty speculation or just making stuff up. No contamination of the data with personal belief systems. To begin, I will emphasize the virtues we will have to adopt if there is to be any hope of scientific progress. Humility, patience, integrity, and skepticism. I'll also propose methodologies we can follow to identify and focus down upon those things we can apply a scientific approach to. I will address some of the specific problems we have with our research, and will even speculate on the intriguing possibility that we are attempting to study something smarter than we are. This is not to say that educated Serious people have never attempted to address the UFO topic methodically or objectively. They have. But this has never shown any sign of becoming a mature science. We need a restart, or maybe even a new starting point. So, let's start a conversation about where our horizon really is, and ask the next logical set of questions. Can we meaningfully formulate these questions in a way that we can empirically test them? For the next installment of Unidentified Science, I will address the most common presumptions about the extraterrestrial conjecture, why there is no real ET hypothesis, and how it relates to the question of scientific UFO investigations and the key value of humility. And next is API founder and director Antonio Paris with the Field Investigator's Notebook. Thanks, Marsha. Well, for me, I think the most important part of the investigation is the interview. You know, we have a lot of gadgets out there. We have a lot of fancy equipment. But I think that sitting down with the witness, and more importantly, sitting down with the witness as soon as possible, is very critical in the investigative process. You know, we see things and... And we soon start to forget what these things are as time progresses. You know, within the next 48 hours is really when I want to sit down with the witness. And this can be either done by email, Skype, uh, FaceTime, or even a, your basic phone call. And it's important that we go down through that checklist that you guys have and, and ask those basic questions about, you know, who, what, when, where, and why, and get a really good description of the object. There are a lot of courses out there that you can take on how to conduct proper interviews. And that's important because trying to detect deception, uh, whether the person's hoaxing you, whether they're lying or exaggerating, is also very important when you're taking your notes down. And that doesn't mean that the person, you know, is doing it intentionally. Sometimes they're nervous. You know, it's natural for us to exaggerate things. But I think the most important thing is that within 48 hours, you have to reach out to the witness, contact them sit down and get as much information as possible. And then later down the road, as you, you progress in the case, you can start calling the witness back again to get additional information. I think it's also important that we ask basic questions and not lead the witness. And if you look at the investigative sheet that I gave you guys, that's the intent. We ask basic questions like, what did the object look like rather than was the object round? You know, that is leading the witness. And finally, I, I really don't think that titles really make any one more credible than the other. 
I get a lot of reports that, well, a pilot reported that or a astronaut reported that. A trained observer is no, is not really the same as a credible witness. And I gave a good example on Twitter yesterday where we had a recent astronaut that was arrested for, for attempted murder. So does that astronaut make her any more credible than anyone else? And I think that's important that we do background investigations on the person as well as the interview process as well. Good points. Good points. Well, Antonio, then how about we get to listener questions? What do we have this week? Today we have Cherish, who's actually our media relations director. And for the last couple of days, she's been gathering various questions from our followers. Hi, Cherish. Hey, Antonio. Thanks for having me. All right, guys. Our first question comes from Mario Overall from Panama City, Panama. He's making a suggestion for you guys to review and check out Project Identification, it's a book. It's the scientific field study of UFO phenomena. It was published by Dr. Harley D. Rutledge in early 1980s. So have you guys had a chance to check this book out previously? Actually, we just got the book a couple of days ago, and I passed it on to Paul Carr, who's who's an excellent book reviewer. So we're hoping within the next couple of weeks, Paul's going to put out a nice review of uh, that excellent book. And now let's go to our 22nd recommendations from the API team. There will be more information about each recommendation in the Episode 1 show notes at your website. So we'll ask each person in turn for a quick recommendation, and they'll have 20 seconds to promote it. I'm going to recommend a movie, Contact, starring Jodie Foster. I recently watched it again on Blu-ray and found it even more moving than when it first came out in 1997. Based on the novel by Carl Sagan, the story is about the romance and the passion of the human quest to answer the question, are we alone? Antonio? Okay, my recommendation is quite simple. As an investigator, it's very important that you always carry around a nice notebook and pen. Too often I've seen too many investigators try to cheat and use a recorder, whether it's an iPhone or a mic or something, only to find out that when they got home, they either lost the recording or the data was corrupted, but they took no notes. So it's very important that I always do both. I take both notes with pencil and pen on a paper, and I also record the investigation. Marcia? My recommendation is to look into um, the phenomenon called apophenia and pareidolia, which is an aspect of apophenia. And this is a tendency for the human brain to see things that may not be there or to imagine things that aren't necessarily true. But an understanding of apophenia and pareidolia is certainly helpful when you go forward with witness investigation and investigations in particular. Cherish. My recommendation would be definitely check out our website. Um, it's very mobile and you are able to use it on the go. You can even upload pictures from your cell phone. So take some time, explore the website, and don't be afraid to send us some information via your phone. That's about it for Episode 1. In Episode 2, we'll bring you a detailed review of an API case and Part 2 of our interview with David Marler, author of Triangle UFOs. We'll also have a discussion with API investigator Ray Nuvalone about the thorny issues surrounding abduction investigations. Paul and Antonio will also return with their features, and we hope to have a whole new crop of questions and comments from you, the listeners. Meanwhile, please feel free to contact API at director at aerial-phenomenon.org or on Twitter at Antonio Paris. Any final thoughts, Antonio? Yes, Marsha. I really want to emphasize that APACon 2014 in Tampa, Florida is going to be a really amazing conference. We have a lineup of speakers that are capable of entertaining a broad spectrum of whether you're a believer or a skeptic. It's going to be in Tampa, Florida, 16th to 17th May at the Bush Gardens Clarion Hotel. And including myself will be Bill Murphy, Anthony Sanchez, Chris Fleming, Dr. John Alexander, Bill Burns, Nick Redfern, and Travis Walton. Early bird tickets are available right now, but they're only going to last up to February 1st. So now it's a great time to get a good deal at this amazing conference. 
All right. Well, thanks for joining us on this episode of API Case Files. We encourage your questions or comments. Please join us at www.aerial-phenomenon.org backslash podcast, where you can read the show notes and participate in discussions. If you want to report a UFO, please go to aerial-phenomenon.org and just click on Report UFO near the top of the page. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Until next time, this is API Case Files. This has been Episode 1 of API Case Files, the UFO Investigators podcast from Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. API Case Files is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations, and all rights are reserved. Our intro theme music starts with Time Surfer by Totality Music and segues into a box cat game song entitled 04-B3. Bumper music is from DJ Spooky. The Marler interview music intro and outro was by William Tyler. The outro music you're listening to now is by DJ Spooky. All music is Creative Commons and used with permission. I'm Marsha Barnhart.